All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Skyrocket Coaching Community Part 10. I'm Michael from Skyrocket. It's good to see folks. I see we got some folks uh, hopping in, uh, hopping in as I speak. Today is going to be awesome. Uh, and probably my favorite topic that we'll touch on, at least thus far. So we're going to talk about the, um, uh, at times challenging, but in my opinion, incredibly exciting uh, Skyrocket Teacher Coaching Strand 2. So if you don't know our framework, and if you're, if you're watching this, you probably do, or at least you should, um, but we are, for this one, we are uh, not just keeping this for our coaching community. We're sharing this with our entire network. So close to 10,000 people, if you want, will watch this video. No pressure. Um, that uh, if, you, if you don't have our framework, go over to our website, skyrocket.ed.org, and download it. It's free. Uh, but the, the, the way our framework is designed, which most of you know, is that we start with strand one, which is classroom culture. And then we move into uh, strand two, which is around instruction or content mastery. And then we move into strand three, uh, which is around uh, rigor. Now, strand one is uh, those are your most struggling teachers. And uh, those folks are oftentimes feeling pretty beat up and feeling like they don't, they don't have a ton of hope. But strand one coaching is usually pretty simple. It's not simple to, to make change because, again, these are our most struggling teachers or our our newest teachers, but strand one coaching is pretty simple. Strand three coaching um, is, well, I wouldn't say it's uh, easy by any means. Those are your more advanced teachers. Those are folks, and if you've coached teachers in strand three, you know that you can say things like, hey, there's a thing you're doing where you're like, when a student gives an answer, you're nodding your head. Um, what it does is it, it makes all the other students think that the right answer has already been given and it, it shuts down, uh, it shuts down conversation, uh, and you may miss out and other students may miss out on hearing something really transformative and really smart from somebody else. And a strand three teacher would hear that and be like, yeah, oh my gosh, you're right. I'm going to stop doing that. And they would stop right away. Probably don't even need to practice. We, we do design practices. If you check out our manual again, for free on our website, so go check that out. But if you check out our manual, you'll see practice activities, but your strand three folks, you give them some coaching and they take it and they run with it because these are your, these are your folks who are, who are strongest. Maybe they've been there the longest, so that's not necessarily always the case or even often the case. And again, our strand one folks, it's, it's oftentimes challenging and there are a lot of tears shed and there's a lot of sometimes frustration, but it's pretty easy to diagnose what's happening in a classroom. If it, give, if it takes a teacher three minutes to give directions that should take 15 seconds. And during that time, they lose the attention of you know, 20 of the 27 students, you know that you need to work on cutting down those directions. Strand two is the hardest strand to coach with them because at this point, your teacher's gotten to a place where classroom culture is pretty strong. Students are mostly doing what's, what's being asked. And now we've got to focus solely on the, is the objective the right objective? Is it measurable? Uh, is it a transferable skill that students can take to other classes or other content areas? Has the teacher thought through an exemplar response, meaning like what does success look like in this lesson? I've shared the story with some of you in the past of the teacher who had students writing summaries and when I asked how they do that, the teacher said, well, they read and then they summarize. But of course, that's not, that's not a, a how, that's the, that's the task. There was no process for how students wrote a summary. So as you can imagine, some students were just writing every word that they read. Some students were giving their interpretation of what happened. Like, I think that, that this happened, right? Other kids were doing bullet points and some kids were writing some, but it's that exemplar response, you know, two, that's Skyrocket 2.2, right? Is there an explicit model in two, which is Skyrocket 
Are we giving kids enough time to practice, which is Skyrocket 2.8? Are we checking for understanding and actually doing something with it? Not the checking for understanding that looks like I'm gonna kind of roam throughout the class and, and just kind of at a 30,000 foot view, see what's happening. And not the, the checking for understanding that looks like I didn't really model. So let me just go to like three kids and just reteach it to them because I know they didn't really hear me or they weren't, uh, my model was unclear. And so strand two coaching is the hardest strand to coach in. And for a lot of teachers, it's the hardest strand to be coached in, excuse me, because you are getting into the, the really the, the weeds of what they're teaching to kids. I say to leaders like yourselves all the time, when you walk into a classroom, you should never be like the person hacking their way through the Amazon rainforest trying to see daylight ahead of them. It's the same thing with a classroom. You should not, it should not be hard to figure out what the skill is for the day, what kids have to do to master it, which means there are steps there, um, the progress kids are making toward it, et cetera. And, and I, before I get into the, the session today, I have to make this clear because I imagine there's somebody listening to this that's saying, yeah, Michael, we don't want our teachers to be really directive with their instruction. We want kids to explore. We want kids to come to a lot of their own learnings. Great. Uh, we actually do too, which is why strand two is the second of our three strands. But what I observed in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of classrooms is that too many teachers, because of their, their bosses, because of their leaders, because of people like us, were cutting the line. They were jumping from strand one right to strand three, even if they didn't have that terminology. They were, and sometimes they weren't even, they weren't even, they hadn't even left strand one. And they were saying things that sound like, hey, everybody, let's get into groups of five and let's figure out this problem together. That comes in skyrocket strand three after the classroom culture is solidified. And after the teacher is so impeccably clear on what they're teaching and what success looks like, that they can then start to really support kids as they work interactively with each other, right? Uh, a strand two classroom, and you'll, you'll see a model of this in a moment, a strand two classroom would begin, all right, folks, here's today's objective. Everybody copy that in your notebook, take 30 seconds, ready, set, go. A strand three classroom might look like, folks, here's our exemplar response for today. I want everybody right now on your own, jot down, what do you think today's objective is? And, and what do you think you're gonna have to do to master it? After we do that, we're gonna to talk to our neighbors. We're gonna see if we can come up with some agreement there. And then I'm gonna ask some people to share out and see what we came up with, right? That's what strand three looks like. But too many schools and too many teachers and too many leaders are coaching their teachers to jump there when we're not ready, when we're like the teacher I described who doesn't actually know what makes a good summary. And you've all seen this. You've seen kids in, 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 in pairs or groups of three or four or five and one student's doing most of the work or they're not clear on what's being asked or they use one word responses and that's the end. I, I, am, un, I am unconvinced or unconvincible that that's good for kids, right? I just, I've never seen one example of it being good for kids before the teacher is ready. So what I've done today is put together a very, very basic strand two model. And I'll jump in between modeling what this looks like and sounds like and then providing voiceover to it. This is like a, a middle school or an upper elementary school writing lesson. I'm gonna ask you, I imagine we have some writing teachers or former writing teachers on the, on the call. Think less about whether this is the best way to teach this or not. It probably isn't. Send me an email and let me know it isn't. But think less about whether this is the right way to teach this or the best way. And more about the process that I'm asking students to follow and how impeccably clear it is for kids what they need to do and how, how impeccably clear it is for me as the teacher, what I'm driving at, right? Students will get better at writing in this lesson, uh, undeniably. Um, will they have the deepest engagement with their, with their classmates? They won't. That's why we're, we're not there yet. We're in strand two. We're building teachers' muscle memory around these pieces. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to, um, obviously uh, watch the video, uh, make note throughout of things that I do that feel uh, very strand two centric. If you're familiar with our, our framework, if you're not, like I said, download it for free. You don't actually need to be to see how clear this model is going to be. For those folks who are familiar with Skyrocket or really familiar, you'll see on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, there'll be some teacher actions in green. 
Uh, and you'll notice that I'm focused on these teacher actions on that current slide. This of course wouldn't be on a slide that you were presenting to students, um, but rather it's here for our purposes. So I'm welcoming you all to writing class. Oh, and by the, end, uh, by the way, at the end of this model, I'm gonna share some best practices for both collecting strand two data and what strand two, like some flags to look for um, around some strand two things. A lot of folks go into to strand two classrooms and they're landing on things that aren't the right things to be landing on. Um, they're saying it's differentiation or checking for understanding when it's the wrong objective, right? They're saying the teacher didn't do like an, ob an objective recap at the end when there's no exemplar response. So how could the teacher possibly do an objective recap? They don't know what success is, right? I mean, I really think about that idea, here, right? If we were a sports team, Right. If, uh, I want you to imagine we're a basketball team and we didn't know that we needed to get the ball in the basket more times than the people we're playing against. If we didn't know that, it'd be impossible for us to be successful. Right. And very often teachers are teaching things and they're not crystal clear on what the end result is. And that makes it almost impossible for kids to be successful, despite their best intentions and, and despite how much they care about students. All right, folks, so I'm going to get into this model. I'm going to uh, be your teacher for a few moments. And the first thing I'll say is, folks, welcome to writing class. Here's what I want you to do is I want you to silently copy down today's objective in your notebook. Um, take 30 seconds to do that on your own. Ready, set, and go. Of course, folks, here's the introduction of the objective. Uh, and what I am sharing here is also... Um, what success looks like uh, in this lesson, right? And so folks, I also want you to jot this down as well. Success in this, um, in this class uh, is, uh, in this lesson is gonna have three parts. We're gonna, whenever we're writing an introductory paragraph, and I, I get, I'll talk about what that is in a moment. Whenever we're writing an introductory paragraph, we wanna have, wanna do three things. We wanna ask a question, we wanna choose a side, and we wanna choose three main ideas and include them in the paragraph. Now, some of you, you'll see on the right that we have 2.4, which is the introduction of the objective and why it matters and what we have to do to master it. I imagine some skyrocket lifers on here are thinking, hey, those, that success, those steps, that skyrocket 2.2, the creation of it is 2.2. The articulation of it to students is 2.4. So that's why that's there. Of course, you'd have to coach the person on 2.2 to get them to a place where they even created this, right? So and then you also notice 2.3, which is uh, low, lower level engagement. 2.3 is designed so that a teacher doesn't teach a great lesson, but has only been calling on a handful of volunteers or only a handful of students have, have offered responses. And now we get to the end of class and half the kids don't know how to do it. Not because their classroom culture is weak, but because the teacher hasn't insisted on lower level engagement throughout the lesson. This is not talk to your partner, come up with three, things. That's not this. We're not there yet. We're just on what's the objective, copy it down. What do we have to do to master it? And you all are going to jot those things in your notebook. All right, folks. So um, today we're writing, uh, I'm back into my model. Today we're writing our introductory paragraph for a persuasive essay. And what I want to talk to you about that, uh, I want to talk to you about what it means to actually persuade somebody. Persuade somebody is to convince them uh, to see your side of things. And we've all had some experience with this at some point. Uh, your mom or dad says, uh, or your, uh, your garden says, hey, you're going to go to bed at, at, at eight. You say, hey, can I please stay up until nine? There's a TV show that I really want to watch. Uh, and, and here's why it matters to me. And if the person says, yes, you persuaded them. At the very least, you tried to persuade them. And so it's important to not only be able to persuade people, but it's important that that first paragraph is really, really strong. And the reason why is like that, that first paragraph, it's the foundation of, of the essay. And it must be strong. If we don't make our arguments really clearly in the first paragraph, it's like building a building with a weak foundation, it'll crumble, right? And so we want to make sure that that initial paragraph is incredibly strong so that the rest of the essay can piggyback off that and be equally strong along the way. The second reason, and this is really a more real world example, and I just gave you one of those with your own lives, but like successful people are excellent persuading people to see their side of things. It's a huge life skill to be able to say, here's what I believe, and I'm going to share it with you in a way that ide ideally convinces you uh, to, do, to, to do it, or at the very least, to see my side of things. The most successful people in the world are incredibly good at convincing people to see their side of things and persuading them to agree. So what I want you to do is make a prediction here. Right? Oh, let me just go back to the previous slide. So again, we're on 2.4 and 2.3. So now I want you all to make a prediction. And here's our lesson. 
what's going to be easy about this and what's going to be hard about it. So what I would have students do here is they, in their notebook, or if I was using guided notes, um, that they would jot this down in their notebook. Now you have to be uh, really, really wary here of not just getting kids to talk about this before they write. By the way, strand two doesn't even prescribe that kids talk to their neighbors about this. Remember, this is very teacher led. We're moving toward getting to a place where kids would talk about this. Likely this teacher's not there yet. We've just gotten into strand two. So I would ask students to make a prediction about this. What's gonna be easy? What's gonna be hard? They would jot this in their notebook. And what I would do is I would call on a couple of volunteers here to share out. What I would also do here at 2.3 is I would say, um, hey folks, we're gonna call on Michael. I want everybody to uh, track Michael. Give a thumbs up if you agree. Give a fist if you have something different to offer, right? Low level engagement, what it forces uh, or what it, uh, what it um, um, you know, what it ensures is that students are present to what their classmates are saying. The learning continues. Michael doesn't share. And if you, if you, if you were ever a teacher, which I imagine is everybody watching this, We've all had those experiences where we call on Michael and uh, he says something and then we call on the next person and they have no idea what Michael said, right? That, that, that thumbs up or fist uh, is, is the remedy for that. So now here's where we get to our exemplar and our model, right? We're still, you'll see 2.3 throughout, throughout most of the, most of the model. Uh, and so what I would do here is I'd say, all right, folks, so I want everyone to, to watch me model this. Um, and this is, of course, our exemplar, which is our 2.2, and our, uh, our explicit model, which is our 2.6. And so I say, all right, so folks, I just want everyone to put their pencils down and watch me talk through this. Um, and, and the prompt that I'm going to use for this model is should students have to wear uniforms to school? Of course, you all know watching this that students love to weigh in on that question. So it's a good one to start with. Uh, and then I would, I would read my, um, I would read my uh, exemplar. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna read this. I don't want everyone to, 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 to do anything now. I just wanna read through my exemplar and then I wanna to talk to you about why I chose these three ideas. And I'm gonna connect them directly to those steps for success, which you see on your screen. And so then I would read through this piece. Uh, and so again, students wouldn't be doing anything except, except tracking me. Or you could have them do, do something here where um, if, if it was a little bit more of an advanced teacher, you could have them actually pull out, hey, underline where you see me asking a question, circle where you see me choosing a side, um, put a, a squiggly line under where you see the, the, those three main ideas, uh, that's, that's all fine. Uh, but, but initially, we say in strand two, go slow to go, to go fast. This teacher needs to be really good at presenting content. There's also another thing as a quick side note, like asterisk, a lot of time teachers, particularly when they're unsure of, uh, unsure of their content or when they're just barely holding on to some classroom management, will we'll, we'll ask kids to do stuff um, because it gives them think time. It gives them like a, a, a reprieve from having to be up there modeling. Uh, it gives them like a breath. Um, it also um, almost preemptively uh, starts to make noise, right? And if a teacher's worried that noise is about to come or that kids are about to push back, it's also for a teacher who's not very confident in, in their model, it allows the kids to carry the cognitive load for this piece. Huge fan of kids carrying the cognitive load, absolutely. We're, we're, this teacher's not there yet, and we've got to we've got to coach them to, to stay to stay still here. So um, they should read this, and then on the next slide, uh, what they would do would be um, to pull these pieces out. And I've color coded this. They could teacher could color code it or not, but they, they'd likely be on a smart board or a whiteboard, underlining or highlighting. But you'll see here that I have my ask a question. Remember, if there's a better way to teach this, that's fine. That's not that's not the point I want to make. Uh, what I'm doing here is, is, is presenting this explicit model and saying, all right, so folks, uh, check, check it out. The very first thing, you'll see this in green on your screen. Uh, I've, I've, I've asked my question, right? Have you ever truly wanted to express yourself but, but couldn't, right? Great, great opportunity to get, to get started with this essay. And the next thing you know, I got to choose a side really, really, uh, really precisely and really quickly. I do not believe students should have to wear uniforms to school. I've made my position impeccably clear. And then... I'm going to use my three main ideas. I'm going to say uniforms for self-expression, which actually uh, tra uh, traces back to our, um, our uh, question at the beginning. They're also uncomfortable and they're expensive, right? And the note I'd make for kids here is your, your question should not include all three main ideas. You'll notice it includes one, and I'll talk about how we got to that one in a moment, but it should not include all three main ideas. 
And so at this point, kids are uh, still still watching, right? What they could also do here is, again, you can have them uh, annotate some of these pieces. Um, they can annotate along with you if you're doing it, or rather if, if you're a teacher that your coaching is doing this. Uh, but kids at this point are just tracking the board because we're doing our explicit model. What I, what I left out here too, which I think is important is some sort of think aloud likely should uh, likely should be included here. So I want to think about my uniforms, right? So um, do I think it's a good idea? Well, you know, it, it is kind of cool that we all look the same and, you know, there's some like unity in that. That's awesome. But to be totally honest, like, you know what? I, I, I think it kind of hurts self-expression. So I'm starting to like get some ideas going here, right? And so that's something that a, a teacher would do in front of students to start to really build out the process. And so I've given my exemplar, but now what I'm doing is I'm doing a, an explicit model around what it looks like to create a pro and con chart. And so I would model this for kids and say, look, I, I, I went through, you know, I started to do my think a lot on the last side. Let me go deeper here. You know, there's no competition if we all wear, wear um, you know, uniforms, you, your, your shirt costs $300, mine costs $3. I don't feel funny because we're not wearing those. Those are at home. We're, we're wearing the same shirt with each other. There's a professionalism aspect. There's a unity aspect. But then I start to come up with my cons, right? And then what I say um, to kids here is like, hey, whichever one is most important to you, that's your question that's going to wind up in your, in your introductory paragraph. And then pick two more, right? And so you'll notice here what I picked. If we, uh, if we go back, have you ever truly wanted to express yourself? So self-expression is the one that to me is most important. Um, then there's the piece about discomfort or them not being comfortable. Um, they're annoying, yeah, but you know what? That doesn't really rise to the level of making it into my essay. Um, and then of course, there's the financial aspect, which is the money, right? So again, I'm modeling here uh, and kids are watching. They're watching my thought process. Uh, and kids are, um, and there's like some light writing that could occur here, um, but for the most part, kids are watching. Now, here is the opportunity for us to start practicing with students, and you'll notice that we start to have some other pieces here. Our 2.3 is still here, which is students having a task, which they've had through this entire lesson. I hope folks have seen this. Those folks who are like, oh, we don't like explicit models or direct instruction. We don't like that stuff at our school. If every school in the country, if every teacher's class just looked like this and stopped there, we would transform, we would transform urban education because kids are being asked to write th this entire time or track this entire time, right? They're learning really precisely uh, th throughout this lesson, a process that, is, that, 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 that they need to, a transferable process that they could use for decades, right? Um, and, uh, and like I said, they are, um, they have, and they also have rationale for why this matters, but they're being asked to engage throughout the process and, and everybody there's, there's really clear tasks, even if it's just tracking. So then we would get into some guided practice here. And so I'd say, all right, so let's use our pro and contra. I would have that posted somewhere, or if it was guided notes, kids would have that in their guided notes. And I'd say, here's the prompt. Should the driving age be moved to 15? Here's what I want everybody to do. I want everybody to come up with one pro and one con for this. Everybody has to do at least that one pro and one con. What is good about this? What is bad about it? And you'll notice that we start to have some new teacher actions on the right-hand side. We have 2.8, which is that students have enough time to practice both guided and independently to master the content. We have 2.9, I'd start to circulate the room and I would start to uh, check, uh, looking over a student's shoulder, kneeling next to their desk, see what folks are starting to come up with. And, and 2.7 is, the, is in there as well. Um, and while I don't have any data, this is, a, this is a simulation, this is a great opportunity to start to see um, who's going to really struggle with this, who needs potentially a different mode to complete this. Remember, when we think about differentiation, we don't change the, the what, we can change the how. And so there might be scholars who um, are going to draw a picture if they're, if they're younger, right? There might be a scholar who tells you uh, orally what, uh, what their pros and cons are, right? There may be, you may get to a point where you ask a scholar, uh, hey, don't come up with three cons, but come up with two or, or like you can modify the content here, but this is where that starts to happen. And it's important because differentiation is mostly a fake word. It's mostly a fake word. Almost nobody does it because they don't have a really clear what I'm trying to accomplish, which is that exemplar. And then they're not, and those steps, and then they're not checking for understanding as it pertains to the exemplar and the steps. So how would I differentiate if I don't actually know what we're trying to accomplish, right? Remember my example of the basketball team 
that doesn't know that they're trying to put the ball in the basket uh, more times than their teammates. It'd be hard for me to say that this person's better at this position than this person because I don't even know what we're trying to accomplish um, or that this person needs different support than this person. So students would start to do this after one pro, one con, we'd start to review. Uh, I would, this would be an opportunity to do an objective check. I'd, I'd, let me pause the objective check for a second. Let's say I got one pro and one con for everybody. I'd say, all right, folks, at this point, choose a side, start to build out either your pro or your con side, uh, you know, more fully try and get at least three uh, pros or cons, whichever side you're choosing. I might call in a few people. Michael, what side are you choosing? Michael's got the pro. Great. Give us one reason why it's a pro. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, Lauren, what side are you choosing? I'm choosing the con. Lauren, Lauren give us one reason why it's a con. Great. Ryan, what side are you choosing? I'm a con too. Great. Give us a different reason than Lauren gave us. Okay, great. Folks, we're on the right track. Remember, folks, we are writing. Here's my objective check. We're writing an introductory paragraph to our persuasive essay. I just circulated the room. I saw that 100% of us, right? That's 23 out of 23 of us had one pro and one con. They were in the right categories. We're on the right track, folks. Let's keep moving toward this objective, right? So kids at that point would then have their pros and their cons. I would check that. This is guided. Again, teachers here will feel really compelled to have kids do that together. That's not, no, they need to learn how to do this on their own. I can support them. I can scaffold throughout. That's what guided practice is. But if you just said, if your teachers just said, hey, you know, Michael and Ryan, just uh, you, you come up with some pros and cons together. We don't know what kids know. We don't know if we're actually building student skill. Ryan might carry the load. I might be along for the ride. I have no idea why I'm writing these things. Um, we're just not, we're just not there yet. It's going to be hard for you, potentially hard for some of your teachers, potentially to, 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 to practice this go slow to go fast approach. Remember, this is strand two. We'll get to strand three. We're, I'm going to do the same thing with strand three in a couple of months, right? Put it on your, I'll, I'll tell you when, put it on your calendar. Right? It's going to be awesome. All right. Uh, so then at this point, what we'd have kids do is they'd start to write with my support, right? This is my exemplar from earlier. I would, I would make sure at this point that folks had their, um, excuse me, that they had their pros and cons and that everybody had chosen a side that, um, that makes sense, uh, that, uh, or that at least is aligned to what uh, their pros and cons say. Um, if you remember the coaching is that, you know, the most important one to you, that's your question. So they, I would have them circle that one as well. Uh, and then they can pick two more, the two, the two that resonate with them the most. And then they would use my exemplar as a model for their, for their guided practice essay. And the way this works, and you'll see that 2.10 is up there, make sure you have the most recent skyrocket framework, folks, because 2.10 is around the academic language needed to master content. You can argue that this has been happening in the whole, uh, the whole lesson thus far, but here's where kids are actually really starting to write. They're starting to write their three main ideas, right? They're starting to actually choose a side. And so I'm putting the 2.10 up here now, but we could argue that kids have been using this kind of vernacular, or at least they're becoming familiar with it throughout the lesson up to this point. So what I wouldn't do is just release kids to write the whole essay at this point, right? Assuming that it's the right objective and assuming that uh, I've used data to inform it, they're not ready to do this. If they can all do this without my support, then my objective's too easy. So that's a problem in and of itself. And that would be a 2.1, Skyrocket 2.1 fix. I'll talk about scripted curriculum uh, later and, and programs and things like that. But what I would have folks do is say, all right, everybody right now, choose your, your, strongest, uh, your, strongest, um, your strongest point from either your pro or your con. And I want you to uh, include that into your question. That's gonna be your first sentence. Everybody right now, write your first sentence. Ready, set, you know, and you could use your TTMS directions, take a minute and 30 seconds to do that silently. Ready, set, go. And that'd be fine. <clears throat> this point. Uh, students would jot that down. I'd be walking around the room. I'd be checking, uh, checking student work. I'd make sure that their main idea, uh, I'm sorry, rather their, that their question and that the main idea that's included in the question is aligned to what was on their pro con chart. Uh, I'll make sure that they chose the side that they said they were going to choose. Uh, I'll call on a couple people at this point to share out their first sentences uh, and then we'll move on. And now I'd have students write their second sentence, which is that choosing the side, I do it the exact same way. And then I have uh, students do uh, the third one as well. Um, again, checking for understanding. If some scholars need differentiation at this point, that's fine too. Uh, and we'd make those and we'd make those shifts. Um, and then 
<clears throat> part of, and this trend is fake because obviously I'm not teaching a real class, but um, I, uh, this is the opportunity where I would, based on my checking for understanding, I would say, hey, some students are using pros and cons as their three main ideas. Uh, once you choose a size, you must only choose ideas from that side. You can even name here that like, hey, life, uh, sometimes in life we have, uh, we believe uh, something is partially true, uh, or we believe that there are both sides to one issue. That's of course fine. We're not gonna do that for our persuasive essays. We're gonna choose a side definitively, and we're gonna stick uh, with it. So uh, we would have folks do that at that point. I would share that with folks. Uh, I might even do some individualized adjusting of instruction for a handful of scholars for whom that, that trend came up. Uh, and I would, uh, and then I would then get us to, uh, to move on. Now, what could happen here is depending on what your data is telling you, uh, if your, um, if your data is telling you that kids are ready to move on to some independent work, uh, then great, you move on to independent work. Your dad is telling you that, like, hey, um, we are uh, we need some more reps at this. Um, then you, the teacher needs to have um, you know some more prompts in their pocket, and they would follow that same process that I followed before, except instead of maybe going sentence by sentence, maybe they'd have students do, or instead of going like uh, you know one pro one con, they might have students fill out the entire pro con chart and then check that. Uh, and instead of doing sentence by sentence when it came to the essay, they might have students do uh, the entire thing, and then they would then they would do some checks. Right? Uh, again, they would make sure that they're checking for understanding and lifting up trends throughout this process, uh, and even providing overall feedback. Something that sounds like, folks, all right, uh, 23 scholars in here. Uh, I checked. Uh, I checked 10 papers. I noticed that seven out of the 10 had, um, you know, they had three uh, three pros. Uh, and I'm noticing that they had, um, uh, and, and that those, uh, those I'm, I want you to pretend I'm doing another guided practice uh, paragraph here. Uh, they had three pros and that those three pros made their way into those three main ideas. Um, for the other three scholars, and of course don't name them specifically, the other three scholars, I noticed that um, in some cases they were, were including uh, pros and cons. I noticed that in some, their pros, I noticed that in one scholars in particular, uh, the pros that they chose, and that was the side they chose, were not reflected in the main ideas in the essay. Folks, remember, we're, we're coming up with our pro-con chart, we're choosing a side, and then we're using those main ideas, three of them, in our essay, right? It's an opportunity to continue to reinforce the teaching, right? This doesn't happen enough. We teach it on the front end, if we've taught it at all, and then that's the end, right? And like kids are just, they, we just expect kids to remember how to do it. We need to be consistently, right, repeatedly messaging what it looks like when, when done well. And so now kids are doing their, uh, so let's assume that kids are, are, they nailed the previous piece or they're at least doing well. Now it's time for kids to do some independent practice. You'll see that 2.8 up there, which is great. We always want kids working. We want them to have time to, um, we want, always want them to have time to do stuff on their own. Uh, should teenagers have to work to get money, they would do their pro-con chart and then they would write their essays without support. They would do this on their own. Uh, this is important. I'll talk about this as a pitfall later, but it's so important. I'm gonna say it twice. Uh, having kids work in groups or pairs for independent practice is a no-no. Don't do it. It doesn't give you accurate data on what students know. Uh, students will become dependent on somebody who's stronger, potentially on somebody who's stronger in the content than they are. Uh, and it doesn't actually give you an opportunity to make kids better once they've gotten to this point. We're basically saying that everybody's a finished product before this, if we're then saying you're gonna do this in a group or in pairs, because it's gonna be impossible for you to give really meaningful feedback. You could give it to a pair, but you wouldn't know who wrote what. Why do that? Let's find out what kids really know. Let's, let's give them an opportunity to be great, or at least an opportunity for us to help them be great. So kids will have uh, written their pieces here. This could go multiple ways. You could um, jot down, excuse me. Um, you could, oh, what I do here, I'm sorry, is I revisit the why. Uh, and I revisit the why, which I shared earlier, the one that's really specific to like literature class or writing class, and the one that's specific uh, or broader to like the world at large. And then what we do here is we would have kids, either you can do it or you can have kids self-assess here. I agree that self-assessment is not the most accurate way to get really reliable data, 
if you create the steps as clearly as I created them here, you'll get really accurate data. You could actually even have partners grade each other's. Um, this is not this is not partner work. It's just it's just looking at the steps and saying you know yes or no. Um, your teachers can you can have, coach your teachers to check everybody's in the class. They probably won't have time to do that. I'll talk about exit tickets in a little bit, but teachers are want to get going to want to get the most accurate data before kids walk out of class, so they're able to say something like, you know, 21 out of 23 of us X, you know, 17 out of 23 of us Y. We said our objective today was to compose an introductory um, paragraph for persuasive essay. Folks, if you got a three out of three on this, um, give yourself some snaps because you mastered today's objective. If you're a two out of three, a one out of three, or a zero out of three, I've made note of who those folks are. I'm gonna check in with you individually. We're gonna get you up to speed as fast as possible, right? And then what happens is the lesson, the lesson ends, right? And we've, and kids walk out knowing if they mastered the thing or if they didn't, um, the teacher knows if the kids mastered the thing or not. And if you're thinking before I have you reflect on this, if you're thinking before I uh, have you reflect that like, man, are kids really gonna be able to do this? Like we've done this with kindergarten classes where kids are able to say whether they mastered the thing or not and why, uh, and it's actually really more powerful when they say the why not, and then name the place where they didn't, they weren't as clear on whatever the step was as uh, they could have been. So here's what I'm gonna ask folks to do in the um, Q&A box, is just um, chat in what stood out to you about, about that model? What about that model stood out or resonates? I'll give folks a couple moments to put that in the chat. Okay, so uh, great, very, it's very directive. Yep, that's intentional. As I said, um, when we get to strand three, it, it starts to pivot. Uh, that's when we put much more of the onus on, on kids uh, where we say, um, hey, look at today's exemplar response. What do you think today's objective is? What are you gonna have to do to master it? We put a math problem up here. Here's a, here's a, a solved math problem completed. Um, what steps do you think I took to do that? Jot that down on your own. Let's talk to your neighbors, see if there's agreement, see the places where you disagree. Be prepared to share what your partner said. Um, great. So super directive. Yep. Really precise uh, process to follow would be really helpful in my own teaching. Awesome. Great. Uh, more teachers should do this. It'd be really helpful. Uh, it'd be really helpful for their lessons. A couple more coming through. What do you do if a teacher doesn't think that they need to, um, what do you do if, if a teacher doesn't think that they're actually strand two and wants to do all the strand three pieces, get collect mastery data. I'm gonna show you that in a second, what it looks like to collect that data, see if kids actually get what they're supposed to do, right? If you want airtight uh, rationale for why we're doing X thing, Data is your absolute is your absolute key, uh, and so question is: Are you strand two teachers uh, teaching in this way? I'm not going to actually go back to the, the question uh, question box here because I think I got some answers from what people shared. Is that it seems like the answer is no? Is it your strand two teachers aren't teaching in this way, um, and it's important, right, uh, that folks are expert planners now. The, the, the million dollar question that comes up is like, hey, our, our curriculum doesn't lend itself specifically to this model. Um, yes and no. Uh, if you are using a curriculum that doesn't have a tangible, I'm not, I'm not talking about, by the way, something that's just like a, something that has like a math sprint or something like that. Those are, those are exercises. I'm talking about an actual curriculum, right? A program where kids are, are, are being taught a lesson. Um, I, I've, I've yet to see the program that doesn't have something tangible or measurable that's supposed to be taught or learned in that day. Will your teachers with your support sometimes need to refine that or hone that? 
Absolutely. There are some programs that have five dif different objectives. You, you, you all are great teachers. You can't teach five objectives in one period. I can't, nobody can, right? So you might have to look at data with the teacher and say, all right, well, what's the most important thing here? Uh, there might be programs, I think of like, you know, Eureka Math, where there's like an exploratory exercise in the front end, that's fine. Um, that's great that at some point a teacher is going to explicitly model a skill for kids and needs to be sure that they know how to do that and needs to be sure that they can also coach teachers, uh, I'm sorry, coach students on how to do that. So we've yet to meet the program or the curriculum. Uh, I mean, I, I could name a, a dozen different programs that folks have brought up over the years. You all know this, but I'll say it anyway. An out of the box program is not just taught out of the box. You need to make modifications. I did that when I was a teacher. I imagine you all did that when you were a teacher. You get the thing, you say, yeah, my kids don't need that. They didn't, yeah, I'm actually going to teach this a different way than they're suggesting here. Um, awesome. We're going to skip that objective. Okay, awesome. We're going to hone, hone in on this objective, right? So this works with any program. You just might have to get a little creative. Be wary of pushback that's just like, hey, this feels harder than what I'm doing, or this is going to force me to internalize my lessons in a way that I haven't been forced to do in the past. Uh, and I don't really love the way that feels. Um, so I'm going to push back and say my program won't allow for it. It will. Uh, and if you have a question, send us an email and somebody on our team will get back to you. Info at skyrocketed.org. Uh, two final things I want to get into when you're looking in, uh, at data as a coach in classrooms. These are some questions on the left that you could be asking. Everything from what are you working on? Why does it matter? What do you need to do to be successful? What's your first step? Sometimes the teachers made these things really clear, but students are shy and don't really know, like they're not maybe not used to you coming in. That's okay. Talk to enough kids where you get a really, uh, a really fair sample size. You still can't get a fair sample size. Um, oh, if you still can't get accurate data from kids, which I've seen very few examples of that, um, make sure that the teacher has really clearly uh, somewhere what the steps are. Um, if it doesn't exist in the class, kids probably don't know what it is. And so that's good data to get. And then you're looking for like, you know, uh, is the content, are kids making progress, right? So if you think about my model, and if I was, if I walked in during guided practice and saw and sampled six kids papers and saw that all six had, you know, chosen a side based on their pro and con chart uh, and that they had, uh, you know, a minimum of, of three Let's say they chose, let's say three chose pro and three chose con. If they had a minimum of, of three pro for the pro folks and three con for the con folks. I'd say that, that there's 100% of kids are making progress toward mastering this. Doesn't mean that they all will master it, but 100% of kids are making progress toward mastering it. And that matters. Um, is it too easy for students? Sometimes that comes up and uh, the teacher hasn't modeled, the teacher doesn't have an exemplar, they don't have steps that, kids, that the kids can take but kids are nailing it. We ask why they say, oh, we did this a couple of weeks ago, or, um, you know, I did this last year and I remembered it. That's a problem, right? It's not the right objective for kids. It's another example of teachers feeling, uh, teachers having the liberty and you all coaching them to have the liberty to modify content when it's not exactly what their students need. Of course, uh, common misunderstandings and understandings and then continued mentions of the objective and what we're trying to do and how our progress is. And then is everybody doing the same assignment? That's fine if they are, if that's what's needed, but we wanna make sure that there's, that there's opportunities for the teacher to differentiate based on, on student need in the class. And then making sure that there's ample time for the different components. Um, I'll talk about a pitfall in the next slide, but you wanna make sure that um, DI or some sort of explicit model, guided practice and independent practice are all really clearly separate and that there's ample time for kids to do to do each because very often uh, they're not. So uh, I want you to look at this. Uh, we'll close out in these next two slides and I'll just do some kind of housekeeping at the end, but um, you've got um, you know some best practices here. Uh, as a coach, look at the objective and the steps first, and you've got to make sure that the measurable, the objective is measurable and, and transferable. Uh, and look to see if there's a how, and those are your steps, right? Um, if it's, you know, students will read uh, and understand a text um, that is not uh, measurable, that's not a measurable objective, right? We don't have any way of knowing if they understand, understand is too broad here. 
Um, but if they said like uh, students will read a text um, and compare and contrast um, uh, uh, two characters, uh, then that is something that is that is measurable. And then look to see if there's an how. How how would I do that? What would what would my steps be? Um, as a coach, be be wary. The the the, the biggest lever is almost never differentiation or, or checking for understanding. People want it to be because it's it's easier to find those things than than to really look at the heart of what's what the issue is. The heart of the issue is usually number one that it's the wrong objective or that the objective is not measurable or that there's no how. So as coaches, sometimes we'll go in and we'll see a teacher who's not checking for understanding or not differentiation, the differentiating or or doing those things pretty poorly. And we'll say that that's the lever that needs to get better clearly, but it's not the thing that's going to move the lesson in almost every case. It's not the biggest lever right now. So it's usually um, 2.1, 2.2, often 2.3, sometimes 2.6. I'm sure checking for understanding is actually checking for understanding. Sometimes folks will roam around the room. I mentioned this earlier, not really looking at what kids are producing. If there's no how, it's almost impossible. There are no steps. It's almost impossible to actually check for understanding because what would be at, what would we be looking for? Make sure that they're not just that the model wasn't weak and now they're trying to compensate for this. I saw this the other day. Um, there was really no model. It was, uh, it was non-existent. So teachers spent like most of the lesson individually working with kids. Individually working with kids is great, but not, not as, a, as a remedy for not having modeled in the front end. Um, the model needs to be an actual model, not like a quasi-guided practice where the teacher's asking kids questions and kids are doing part of it and students come out to the board. And now, you know, like it's got to be an actual explicit model where the teacher says, watch what this looks like. Um, and, um, and I'm going to show you the steps. I'm going to think through my process. I don't want anyone to do anything right now except to focus on me. Uh, and then every teacher on earth can get better at 2.3. It's ensure, it's designed to ensure that no students get le can uh, get left behind. Uh, and and every teacher, myself included, have at some point said, um, has at some point said, like, hey, who can tell me? Who knows? Uh, these this is the antithesis is to uh, antithesis of 2.3. These questions are going to elicit responses from one or two people, potentially some call outs. Some of our more shy students, some students who process more slowly get left behind here. We don't want kids to get left behind. Of course, we want them to be really clear on what's being asked. So this is an opportunity to say, hey, uh, everybody jot down one thing you remember from yesterday's lesson. Everybody right, make a prediction about what you think will be hard about today's lesson, what you think might be challenging about it. And then exit tickets are okay, but teachers should be collecting data in the moment. Um, your teachers should not be spending their, their, their nights on the couch uh, grading exit tickets, unless that's a school-wide expectation. Now, if they want to use two a week as, as grades for the kids, that's great. It's a it's good, good additional you know, data for them to get. It's also a great way to hold kids accountable. If kids know like, hey, like randomly, these are going to be pulled as grades. I'm, I'm always going to work my butt off. That's awesome. I, mean, I prefer intrinsic motivation, but it's fine if it's extrinsic in some regard. Um, but just make sure that folks, you, if you're coaching folks to get data in the moment as often as possible. And then watch out for like the, I want you to finish this for homework. It's a 2.8 issue. Um, the, I, didn't plan, I didn't plan correctly or effectively. I did not, um, you know, I did not, uh, my, my, guided, my, my direct instruction uh, was too long. Uh, my guided practice lasted 28 minutes. Now the kids, when it comes time to really find out what kids know, I'm going to ask them to do it for homework. And I look, I'm a parent of three kids. Do I help them with their homework sometimes when I'm home? You bet I do, right? I mean, I, I, I'm an educator and like you all, like I make them do most of it on their own, but other times when I'm like, hey, here's what this problem means. Here's what they're asking to do. Absolutely. We want to find that out in class. And that's why we need that 2.8 to rock solid. And then having kids work in both groups and I, for IP or guided is a 2.8 issue. It's impossible to gauge content mastery if, we um, if we're doing that. So your teachers, uh, I shouldn't say all, but some will want to do that. It's comfortable for them. I was in a class recently where kids were taking a test, uh, test, but they were talking to each other through the whole thing. We asked the teacher, what's supposed to be happening right now? Well, I'm, I'm letting them work together for this. You're letting them work together for a test. Okay, great. Um, she, she just wasn't, she wasn't strong enough yet. And she was struggling and she made a a really, really poor decision based on that. 
I'm not putting her down, but um, it's, the, it's the wrong move every time. Uh, all right, folks, well, look, phenomenal, phenomenal time. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming and for, uh, for sharing. Uh, we're going to be back on Wednesday, the 11th of January. So uh, we'll see you then. Thanks so much for a great start to the year. And um, just can't say enough, even though I don't know most of you, just I know if you're on this call that you care immensely about the work you do and about the kids you serve and, um, and the impact that you are, are intending to have. So just can't, uh, can't thank you enough. We're humbled that you all are a part of this program and uh, I'm grateful that you're all here as well. Enjoy your break. You've probably seen these slides before, but I'll show them to you anyway, or Amy will yell at me, but uh, log in. Uh, for, this is for only for SCC folks, not for people who are watching this as a webinar, but um, you can find all of our materials at your login and then um, go to resume course and then view product. Uh, and you'll be able to get to all of our previous videos and all of the materials as well. Uh, and you can go to the, um, this is where you find the recorded, uh, previous recorded webinars which is super cool. Watch them, watch them again. And then of course, join our members only LinkedIn page um, and share ideas with your, um, with your partners and with your colleagues. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a phenomenal rest of your week and um, see you in the new year. Appreciate you. See ya. Bye-bye.